Let us talk about the different type of sources that seem able to generate randomness. On the screen you have some examples, in each case a square with 40,000 bits coming from different sources. One from atmospheric noise, from static, generated by a radio receiver with no noise filter, with a fraction of it actually coming from a chaotic feedback loop, and another possibly from the cosmic noise as a result of the Big Bang. Indeed, the Big Bang left some background noise that can get into some channels, radio and television. On another square, we have bits coming from a quantum source, from timing radioactive uh, decay detected by a Geiger counter. Both atmospheric and quantum bits were obtained from a website and service called quantum.org. Finally, another window shows the digits of the mathematical constant pi in binary. The set of atmospheric bits comes from a chaotic but a deterministic system according to the laws of classical mechanics, and thus is of causal nature. It comes not from accident but a long sequence of cause and effect, probably going all the way back to the Big Bang. The bits in this window are deterministic in the sense that there is a state previous to the one on the screen that can fully explain the future state of the system, no matter how complicated. Indeed, the only way that this window of random bits looks random is because it is extremely difficult to reproduce the initial condition for those atmospheric values to be set in the precise way to reverse the process and indeed it is very extremely difficult to reproduce the same window. In contrast, on the third window we have binary digits from the mathematical constant pi, which are not only deterministic, as we can reproduce them any number of times from the same source, without any loss of information. In this case, from a formula for pi reproducing digit by digit. In fact, we can reproduce the same bits from any formula of pi, and there is not only nothing unpredictable or even chaotic about the digits of pi, but we have access to the source and cause for them, yet the arrangement of bits appear random. The causal origin of these digits can be explained in various ways, including the relationship between the ratio of the length of a circle and its diameter. Finally, we also have the window with quantum bits from a quantum source, whose digits may be explained by completely different me mechanics than classical mechanics, and this is described by quantum mechanics, and may, they may have not been produced in, an, in a predictable fashion, but allegedly according to some theories uh, in a de non-deterministic um, way. However, one can see that the images look very similar despite their very different nature and different source. Statistical tests are sometimes useful, but clearly would fail to capture the nature of these sources. In the application of Shannon entropy to these windows, for example, and without knowledge of the sources, uh, values would not tell apart these cases, and we will see what algorithmic randomness can tell about them, both in theory and also in practice, when trying to actually calculate things. One can emulate some types of randomness using computer programs such as cellular automata. Traditionally, one may think that simply feeding a computer program with a trivial input will always produce a trivial output, such as with Wolfram's Elementary Cellular Automaton Rule 18, starting from a single black cell, which is the, possi the simplest possible initial condition. And it may also be thought that only by feeding random inputs to a cellular automaton, one may get some random looking behavior back, such as from Rule 22, starting from a random initial condition. However, this is not always the case. Not all computer programs, no matter how simple, reproduce only random-looking output from random-looking input. This small computer program, for example, Elementary Cellular Automaton Rule 30, 
was found by Stephen Wolfram to, able, able, to be able to intrinsically generate random looking behavior from even the simplest input, the black cell. Here depicted is, for example, the one side of the evolution of the cellular automaton that shows no apparent regularities. This random looking behavior is also called pseudo-randomness because it is deterministic and so it is simulated. We will see how algorithmic complexity provides a framework to distinguish between these sources and cases that traditional approaches cannot easily tell apart. For algorithmic information, it won't be easy either, and we will face some serious challenges, but we will see how it offers directions for improvement, whereas Shannon entropy is mostly a dead end. Let's see some of the statistical properties in one of the objects used in our previous example that is the mathematical constant pi, but this time in decimal, as it is most typically shown. The constant pi is actually believed to be more Borel normal. That is a concept introduced by the mathematician Emile Borel, and it will be quite important to understand it, because we will later use this concept to explain some exa examples in which the application of entropy can be proven to be deceiving. Borel normality means that each digit in an object appears exactly the same number of times, so the number of zeros appear as many times as the number of ones and the number of uh, twos and threes and so on, up to nine when we are talking about decimal expansion, all of them with equal frequency. And not only each digit, but each pair of digits, and then each triplet, and so on. So. If pi is Borel normal, as it has been conjectured, it means that it has no statistical regularity in the limit. No sub subsequence is overrepresented, but only temporary, if anything. As the sequence gets larger, local regula regularities may appear, but they will also vanish. Pi is actually believed to be Borel normal in all bases, including in binary, and that property is called absolute Borel normality. While it is not known for sure if pi is Borel normal or absolute Borel no normal, all the statistical evidence suggests it is. In this plot, for example, we can go through a long segment of digits of pi and see how all the pieces of the pi chart, no pun inten intended, representing each of the digits of pi, gets about the same size the greater the number of digits that are produced and only at the very beginning there are small noticeable fluctuations, and this happens in all bases. However, normality does not capture the concept of randomness either. For example, the chamfer own constant is produced by putting all positive integer numbers together in a sequence, as if they were an expansion of a real number. The result is something like 0 0.1 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. When the number of digits grows, the slices of the pie chart become nearly equal, indicating that the constant is normal, at least in base 10, for single digits. No proof of normality is known for this number in other bases, but it is normal in base 10 by design. Here we can see the statistical evidence, and it is not too difficult to see why by design it is normal, because we will asymptotically use about the same number of digits at any given time when going through all possible uh, positive integers. Another constant, called the Cop copland erdos constant, is obtained by concatenating the digits of the primes instead of the positive integers, and looks like 0 0.2357113 and so on. Copland and Erdos proved that this constant is Borel normal in base 10, similar to the chamfer own constant, meaning that in the limit the frequency of each digit is 1 over 10 for single digits. But, but clearly, it is not random. So how to characterize randomness? If sound measures such as Borel normality, Shannon entropy, and even the whole body of traditional statistics may not properly characterize it, in any way in which intuitively should, stay tuned and later in this unit you will see.